Hey y'all. This is actually going to be the second time I've done this video. The first time, basically discussing how to do um, the tips of my paddle bows. I wound up, believe it or not, no, I know it's hard to believe, but I wound up going off on tangents. I discussed Evergreen College, um, communism, the the, the famine that struck the Ukraine, 1932 and 1933, along with some other topics. I'm going to go just straight in the bows. I, I downloaded that first version. It's marked private. If people want to see it and hear like how I can save the universe with my, my, my deep thoughts, um, more power to you. I'll, I'll make it public. But for now, I'm going to really for the purpose of showing you while I'm waiting for the rawhide to get here to go on this series of paddle boats and the molly, um, how to put the tips on them and, and a few other little tidbits. Well, I had a question from a, a gentleman, Seth. Hey, Seth, thank you for watching. Regarding the other types of woods and bow designs that would be good for wood that can be procured at big box stores. And of course, red oak is probably the most prevalent of uh, um, big box store wood that goes into making bows. If you're lucky enough that they have hickory for some reason, I've never seen it in a big box store, although there's hardwood shops that sell varieties. Hickory, of course, would be a good choice for one reason. Let me turn this down so I don't get in trouble by the YouTube guys. Um, for, aside from all the other reasons that hickory is a good wood, it's relatively safe for beginners, new people at bow making because it's so tough. It's very forgiving. Maple, the hard maples. You cannot take, say, uh, a genus, a group of trees such as maple or elms or hickories really and say that all of them are the same within that genus. When it starts getting in species, you get differences. There are hard maples, there are soft maples. Generally people when you go to the store, I'm not sure if they sell silver maple, which is a soft, but sugar maple, rock maple, they would be hard maples. That's particularly good bow wood. There may be, it may be possible to say accurately that with the maples, they are, I love them, so I don't want to like say anything negative. Maybe a little more, um, little trickier to get a bow out of them because you're walking that fine line between say a performance wood and which I consider a hard maple a performance wood and the possibility of breaking you know there's there's less of a margin of of error when it comes to maples they don't have an interlocking grain like elms elms um the ulnuses the ulni or hickory and so you you run into that issue you could make a variety of bow styles out of the woods that are in that white wood group the hickories and the oaks and the elms and the maples and I'm gonna throw a walnut in there too if obviously black walnut doesn't have a white heartwood but it's considered a white wood um, which is also good bow they all make good bows I, I would say that if you're just starting out and you're unfamiliar with woods the, the first thing you should do is try to make a working bow and then make a second working bow not concentrate on like making your dream bow right away although there's many people <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, Brian Timmons who is a woodworker to begin with so that video that he did with his first long bow was pretty darn stellar it was a beautiful bow and it good proportions very graceful it was you know, not the typical first bow somebody would make. He's a talented young man. Excellent beard, too. Great beard, Brian. Um, and so let's get to making these tips. Normally, and, and you saw them, I had three paddle bows set, and then the Molly, Molliga bed. Some people, Molar Gay bed. Some people call them Holmagard. I'm not going to get tripped up. Ancient style of bows. Here it is with the, the, the tips, the needly tips, and you should be able to see, I'm not I'm poking at you, but the channel that I put into the base of these. 
Um, you'll, you'll see it in greater detail later. I'm not going to monkey with that one. That one definitely I am going to rawhide back it um, before I work the tips. But I have this paddle ball, and as long as I do not put a waxy string on those string grooves or get a waxy anything or a greasy anything on the back, which would disrupt me gluing the rawhide to the back, I'm good. So I'm, I'm going to go through the steps of the tips, the tip making. I, I mentioned in my first video, you might watch both if people say, yeah, mark that public so we can watch it, that, 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 that weird trip that I made through various subjects before I got to making bows. I, I mentioned that um, these bows, let me hold them up so you can see, I like them, you know, they... You could go off on tangents and discuss the, the golden ratio and the Fibonacci number and all these series, these progressions of numbers um, that denote proportionality and, and, and designs that are pleasing to a person's eye. Basically follows them. Uh, pick either one, you know, the Fibonacci number and the, the, the golden um, ratio. They're pretty... Much they are they are joined joined at the hips like Siamese bow twins. Now I like to get as much of the unnecessary wood off of you know these creatures as possible. You lighten them up, um, take the wood away where it doesn't really matter, and then things just move a little better. The tips are a beautiful place to remove wood to remove mass um, because speeds them up. You just figure something lighter can accelerate faster than something that's heavier. And the tips are definitely the area where um, extra mass is not needed or wanted. You could basically take this or any bow, your long bow that you're working on at home, and you could you could form needle tips, like knitting needles, very thin things. Um, if you're good with knots, you don't need to have any collars or anything to keep them from slipping down. There's certain types of knots that will, will grip. So you can actually change the length of the bow, changing the draw weight. But that's an ancient European design just to have needly tips. Literally, they look like needles. You could take a wrap of, of glue and cotton string or, or sinew, which I use, and make little collars to keep the string from slipping down. You could even make a, um, a wedge out of bone or wood or whatever cow horn, unicorn horn, and then lash it to there and have like this little tiny overlay like thing that will keep the string from slipping. Nonetheless, let's get to work here. And I'm not working outside because precipitation, kind of a, a mushy, rainy, snowy, yucky stuff, and I don't want to get water on these things, so I'm just going to proceed. I do, and here's the finished, the tip. I don't want to shadow this thing. There we go. And you can see that on this, it gets thin. This is the thinnest point on the limb. And then it gets thicker, thicker, thicker at the tip. Because I like that swoop. I like that little bit of added thickness there. And it's a needle tip. The string just slides right off. There's not a whole lot of weight or mass on that. I'm using them interchangeably. Um, they're different, but they can. you can think of them as the same. And it's simple that... The first step everyone can do, at no time will my hands leave my wrists. Uh, I need a marking device. I'm going to use a pencil. This thing should be sharpened. And some way of, of measuring this, because I, I, I do my tips. I could do it a half inch um, from the bitter end of the bow, but I do it three quarters of an inch. And that a lot of that is just style. I, I've made them and sold them with a half inch starting from the, the bitter end but I like the looks of three quarter and you know why not is it going to change anything no I mean you could say that when you shorten it by a total of a half an inch you're going to reduce the the weight of the bow to draw weight by I don't know maybe two or three pounds but you know what's two or three pounds really when you're talking a bow that's about 45 to 50, two or three pounds, is rather insignificant. 
a round rasp, round file. I forget what this is. Maybe it's like um, 3 sixteenths, I think it is. And I'm not going to go ahead and then just start on this side and make that groove all at one time. I want to do it in two phases. And at this point, 45 degrees, all I want to do is mark it. All I want to do is mark it. And you don't want to go too deep because the deeper the go you go, the less opportunity you have to adjust it. Because you might think, oh, I drew those pencil lines exactly. But you know, anyone can like run the first thing down there and it's not perfectly even. And all I did there, I could remove this like I did in my first video and then show it to you. But trust me, I hit the, 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 the ball 45 degrees, 40 degrees, 47.3, doesn't really matter. Just very faint, just so I can see, boom, 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 even. Now with pin knocks, they differ a little bit from groove, string grooves. Suppose you were to make grooves on either side of of the the limb on a typical like longbow that just has grooves and not a pin knock if you didn't do them even you would notice them with pin knocks because you're removing a, a lot of the wood at the very end you can adjust the distance so you know i'm not saying that any of my paddle bowls go out with a variance of like one thirty second of an inch but if they did it would be because um you know, I had to do a little bit of adjusting on them. But that is neither here nor there because none of them go out with that variance. We work in a matter of microns around here. Now I've got the mark, just kind of doink, doink. I can see it. Don't want to over talk this. I'm good at that. If you watch my videos, you understand. And now I just want to get faint angled marks on either side. Faint allows me to adjust them because when I flip this thing over I want to make sure that I get the same effect that everything is even and so I don't know usually I start on this side maybe it's bad luck to start on the other side about 45 degrees now I have less I have less of an issue if I do not get the perfectly um, angled uh, number of degrees on either side because these are pin knocks what does that mean? The string grips. I don't have that big loop where you've got an open space there. And I don't need to worry about that string laying in that groove perfectly. You know, when you string it and then here's the bow tip, the strings like this. I don't need to necessarily worry as much with pin knocks getting that, that angle perfect because the string is gripping it. And what works with pin knocks is actually to have a little less angle than you would if this was a two loop standard string long, but with just string grooves and not pin knocks. Look at how I overcomplicated just making something skinny that a string can grip. Okay, that's exactly 43.973 time degrees. And I'm gonna do my best as to guess at that. Now, if I don't have it perfect, that's okay, I can adjust it. I shall check the perfection when I flip it over. I'm gonna have to make that. The lighting is kind of substandard in here. I make, I'm creating my own shadow like a groundhog. I'm gonna have to like do that so I can see it. Do that so I can see it. And I'm gonna put that there, perfectly even. I'm working like a bat here. This is difficult circumstances. And I suppose I can take this off and, and allow you not to see it either because the lighting kind of stinks. But I have just the minor doinks in there and then on the side, just very shallow. On that side, very shallow. And that way I can adjust it and make sure it does indeed line up there and so I'm going to keep this the belly side because I am going to increase the depth now that I like the, the layout of this I'm going to have to take this off it's all right it's warm it's probably about 30 degrees in here
Normally, I would not be working in the dark on a boat. A big danger is, not that it's a big danger, is when I'm doing this step, I want to make sure that I'm not moving this, angling it up perfectly straight as you're making that, that bend to take it towards the center. between where those things lie it's the same as that I've done this a couple times on that malig <laughs> molar gay bed bow they would actually wind up touching and then curving down because that string I like to have it in this nice little cubby on those uh, skinny tips it helps prevent any potential propeller twist because of the string like rotating the imaginary bow making video because you can't see you just got to listen now I've got everything done here I've got it finished down to this point on the belly where I want it now I just have to like get this in and rotate it I'm so good I haven't mentioned like anything not in bow related yet We'll take this off so you can see it. At this point, we're about at where most bows would call it good. I've got the same distance here as I do right there. Same as on this side. Nice groovies. Those are string grooves. Now we're going to take those string grooves and we are going to modify them. We are going to metamorphosize them into pin knocks. And it's a simple matter. Just like when I'm beveling stuff, I want to get this shape on this edge the same as that one down there, the same as that one, and the same as this. You do it step by step. You don't just like take this side of the bow and then just grind it to the finish point and then go to this one. I do it step by step because that gives me control. And the first step on the back side, the side that's facing towards you right now, I want to. Grind that away. You know, I have kind of a, a primitive workshop, primitive heating, primitive lighting, but that's the way it is. Okay, so I simply, because you saw it so clearly, got this bow. All I did was just get that bevel on the top. I'm not finishing in that finishing that pin knock. I'm just beveling that top. Now I'm going to bevel it on the opposite side. And my goal is to have a strip of wood untouched by this Nicholson rasp running the length all the way off that. Like a lemon going off a cliff. You know, lemmings actually don't do that. I think it's just made made up by people that despise lemmings. Oh, okay, to save time here, I have, well, why not? I'm not forcing you to watch us. Don't yell at me. Right along the top there, just a nice parallel um, even, nice strip of wood, untouched, and in the bevels. Now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna bevel the other side. Right, it gets exciting now, or pretty close to now. I like to do this bevelly thing instead of just fully rounding it, which you could if you're daring. You could take a sharp knife. And then just split that wood up. But the problem with board bows is the grain can be unique. And you wouldn't want to take a knife and then just chip that off and have it go in the wrong direction. 
trying to be delicate here. Because that's just the way I am. One advantage of having a Jorgensen clamp here instead of like the dumb head bench where you have to put it down to your feet, I have mobility. And I'm going to amaze and shock you at this point. This is the finished, isn't that pretty? And then this is what I have so far. And you'd probably say, John, put that back on the bench and use your rasp some more. Well, well, my friends, at this point, I'm actually going to break up my sanding block and finish it up. If I was to slip with my rasp, now once I get into like the mode of making bows, making bows, making bows, making bows. I would have done this with the farrier's rasp because, you know, I'm in, back in the practice, full practice and, and quick and fast on my feet. And less, there's a, a lot less potential for me to like screw something up on the last step, you know, doing this, whereas Give me a few months and I'll be using the farrier's rasp on a lot of this just speed things up. And I can do that without damaging stuff. But this is the first set of pin knocks that I've put on a paddle bow in months. Just hang in there. It's about to get exciting. I just like sandpaper. It works a little slower. You have less of opportunity to mess something up. And I do things in stages again. So, it is not finished to the nth degree there because there are still a few more steps. Getting close, I like to work on one side, then rotate it, do the other, and then keep doing that. Each time it gets closer and closer to the finish. This is one of my favorite steps right here though. When things start looking cool, I better give this some room because farriers were asked, they want to slide off there, wouldn't that be embarrassing? back here so I can make sure that it's level. Taking advantage of the natural curves of a paddle bow. Uh, well, you saw what I did there. I just took it and rounded it down. Again, sandpaper. And now this shape I'm looking at right here, because I rounded it down, gets wider as I go back. So I am going to bring this shape up here back to parallelity, parallelism. Honestly, I had working tips as soon as I put those stringers on there, but we don't stop there. We were fine. We make stuff elegant. Um, and I'm doing the best I can considering this light is like ridiculous. I shaved myself, so I'm doing this by echolocation.
now we're starting to see the effects of pin knack making. There's a lot of subtleties that go into the overall look of a bow. I could take this basically, not round the back, just have it flat. Um, not go to a great length of, you know, doing finishing work, and it would be a perfectly functioning bow. But looking at it, just the act of rounding it to the right degree, wow, I really like that. I don't know what it is about it that I like, but I really like it. Just intuitively, it starts speaking to us. Um, the handle, you know, rounding that perfectly, This I need to do a little more finish work on this. And the tips. This definitely is one I just worked on because it is just flat all the way to where I stopped. It's a little flat on the sides. It's a little rounded up there. But I don't need to have this much wood on the tip because of leverage. It doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't bend. I can remove a lot of material there and, and still have it retain a great deal of strength. So I'm going to remove some wood. My sandpaper, 80 grit. Take the strip. This began with a half a sheet of sandpaper. Turn it into quarters. Get this little thing. Not perfectly done, but whatever. There's a whatever factor. Put it on my sanding block. And now, give myself enough room here because I need, I need room to stretch is that as I'm doing this, as I'm rounding, I'm not going to round the belly all the way down here. I want it to go from somewhat flat to then round. And the string is not held on by these points that stick out on the belly side. I mean, they're just there. So I can remove that. And as I do this, I'm also going to be sanding that pin knot. That's going to smooth it out. And by doing this off the end, it's it's sanding that pin knock in a way that works with the whole design, with the whole look of it. More pressure here than here. I'm kind of grading it. It's a spectrum. I'm even turning it, going from flat as I get towards the tip. Sandpaper is a funny thing too. It seems like if you're sanding 90 degrees to the grain, um, it removes wood faster. And so one of my techniques for grinding with, say, a rasp or sandpaper is it's kind of at an angle to the bow. Not sideways, not lengthwise until I'm finished sanding it, but kind of uh, angle. I'm not going to say what kind of an angle. Kind of angly also helps to develop a certain amount of ambidextrism, which I lack. And no, I appreciate you can't see much. I can't see anything either. I'm doing this from memory and feel. But you repeat a certain uh, movement a number of times. turkeys hear me. And that is that. Down Jorgensen. So I have that. Still could finish sand a little bit, but there it is. Pin knocks. I really should have waited again to rawhide back it before I did that, but the nice thing about this, not touching that tip with any waxy substance like a, a B50 or artificial sinew, which Artificial sinew is oh, Dacron, and, and it's not Dacron, it's, forget what it is, a little stretchier than Dacron B50, but they all have wax on them, and that would keep the rawhide from bonding. Where I was going with that is when the rawhide bonds onto that, I can get it to stick in that channel so the rawhide is actually going to go kind of around that, that pin knock and in the channel that will help cushion the string. So, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of other kind of a thing. That's it. I hope you got something out of this. Appreciate your viewership. 
Um, I guess, you know, if you have questions about bow wood and making bow and design, buy my book, a bow maker's notebook available on Amazon. Also makes a wonderful Christmas present. Yes, I did a plug there. I'm normally very modest, but you know, why not? It, it's a good book. It has a lot of good information and it will help you and you won't break, break the bank. That's it. You are released from this for final formation. Yes, it is. It's dinner time.